All right, uh, welcome everybody to our combined EOL MQ seminar. I'm glad to see a good number of people here. Our guest today is uh, John uh, Savislak. Is that close enough? Yeah? Nicely done. I should have practiced before. Nicely done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's from uh, NOAA HRD out in uh, Miami. And let me give you a little uh, history of John. Uh, John works at the HRD as a uh, assistant scientist uh, through the Co Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies at the University of uh, Miami, Rosenstiel uh, Rosen School, right? Marine, yeah. yeah. Close enough. Um, his research has predominantly been on both the genesis and intensification of tropical cyclones. Uh, he has participated in a number of hurricane fill programs through NASA and more recently uh, NOAA. Uh, his big interest is observational data sets such as drop zones and airborne radar as well as satellite remote sensing of tropical cyclones. And in fact, we just had a little meeting talking about the hurricane drop zone archive uh, that we'll be working on together with him uh, to update that, bring that into uh, current days. Uh, John earned his uh, Bachelor uh, in Meteorology at Penn State in 2006 and then moved to uh, Utah to get his uh, Master and PhD in Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Utah uh, with uh, Ed Zipser as his advisor. Yep. So a big name in your career, that's a good thing. Uh, I actually looked up, he has 12 publications, four of them first, auth first authored, which is a fair amount of work. And uh, today, uh, we uh, hear this talk about what governs intensification of tropical cyclones experiencing moderate vertical wind shear. Now with that, please. Tom. All right, well, yeah, thanks, Holger and, and George, for arranging this, this seminar for me. It was kind of gets kind of more last minute, but uh, I really appreciate it. Um, it actually, I was thinking the last time I was here, I think it was 2009, the ASP Summer Colloquium on Observing Systems, and, and that was, I think that was the last time I was in a car. So. It's nice to be a back out west. Uh, I spent eight years in Salt Lake, enjoyed the mountains, and obviously Miami is a slightly different environment. Um, so it's nice to come back out here and, and see mountains and get away from traffic, and, and uh, so it's, it's been enjoyable. Um, so yeah, the, the title of this talk is, is What Governs Intensification of TCs, and um, we preface this with those experiencing moderate vertical wind shear, and, and I hope most of you understand what I talk about when I mean vertical wind shear, but we're talking change of wind speed and direction with height. And for the purposes of, of the research that I'm going to show, this vertical wind shear is predominantly comes from the statistical hurricane uh, intensity prediction scheme model, just 850 to 200 millibars, so over a deep layer uh, shear. Uh, research is definitely showing that uh, there are more particularities to shear in the shear profile, whether there's contributions predominantly at low levels or upper levels, and those details can be very important on intensification. Um, and there's some very nice research being done on that, but just for this purposes, we just use this 850 to 200 millibar uh, shear value. Uh, so the work I, I'm going to show here really is not just my own. It's, it's, it's a compilation of work by a number of, of really good scientists. Uh, Rob Rogers, who's also at HRD, Leon Nguyen, who is a, a NRC postdoc at HRD, um, as well as contributions from Jun Zhang, HRD, and, and Ed Zipser and Trey Alvi, his PhD student, we still work together at Utah, and then uh, Haiyan Zhang and, and her former student Chang Tao at FIU, because I was formerly at FIU and I work with both of them. So this is really a compilation of all our efforts in looking into and this problem, and they all deserve a lot of recognition for that. And so. Uh, what I'm showing on the screen here is, is an example from this year, Hurricane Harvey. Um, essentially what this is is, is passive microwave images uh, over a sequence uh, of uh, about two days while Harvey was undergoing intensification. Uh, this is from the 85 to 91 gigahertz frequencies and, and passive microwave. Essentially these detect um, the scattering that occurs from the emission from below. So when you get the, the emission uh, from below, from the, the liquid water, ice can scatter that signal. And so as you scatter more and more from more hydrometeor or ice hydrometeors, larger hydrometeors, that depresses the brightness temperature, essentially giving us a, a view of not only the precipitating area, but also the deep convection for the, the colder brightness temperatures, which are in the red. Now, this storm itself was not actually moderate shear. It was actually more lower shear. It was about 8 to 10 knots for much of its intensification period. But I simply show this as a demonstration of uh, the theme of what this talk is about, which is up shear precipitation. So the sense of 
storms that intensify tend to become more azimuthally distributed in terms of the precipitation. So you like to see precipitation go all the way around the center. And that's what we're looking for when storms intensify. And what we want to do is find out what governs that intensification, what processes are behind getting precipitation all the way around the center of a storm, like you see so here in, in Harvey. So I'm going to start with the, the stereotypical, you know, oh, surprise, look at this. Um, I'm showing two storms here. These are two uh, infrared images, um, two individual storms. I won't say which ones they are. Um, some of you will probably be fairly familiar with these, though. Uh, they're both tropical storms. Uh, the one on the left is, is 50 knots, and the analyzed uh, deep layer shear value from ships was 13 knots. So it's in this moderate shear, 10 to 20 knot range. Uh, and then on the one on the right is also a tropical storm, and it, its uh, shear value is again moderate, although on the higher end of moderate of 18 knots. And so what I'm showing on the, what I've kind of put in the text here is the Hurricane Center forecast discussion about the times that these two images were taken. So the one on the left, just some highlights from their discussion, they essentially said that the cloud patterns become better organized. Uh, it's more symmetric. Uh, the center is still located on the southern edge, but that symmetry is important because they say now, the outflow is better defined, and it has the opportunity to strengthen during the next couple of days. Pretty optimistic forecast. The one on the right, obviously, if you look at the IR images, it doesn't look as well organized. Certainly, the cloud pattern is not more uh, as symmetric. And they say, well, the center is exposed. If you look at the visible imagery, the center is exposed uh, from the deep convection, which is usually a signal that the storm is not exactly ready to intensify. And they said, well, only slight strengthening uh, is predicted in the next 24 hours, given what they were observing at the time and the model forecasts. Well, of course, this is the whole surprise. The storm on the left, 24 hours later, had only intensified maybe a mere five knots. The shear had increased um, 17 knots, and that happened to be Tropical Storm Carl, a storm that we sampled with the uh, NOAA aircraft in 2016. The storm on the right is Hurricane Matthew, which in the 30 hours after that IR image had intensified to 120 knots. Uh, so 60 knot RI in uh, just over 24 hours, still remaining under apparently a shear value of 17 knots. And Matthew would also go on to intensify to 140 knots, uh, Cat 5 hurricane six hours later. And so Carl, they actually still expected it to strengthen and it never did. It just continued to recurve. It got more and more sheared. The precipitation became more and more asymmetric nothing much else happened. And of course, Matthew, we know, had a, a, a rather um, unfortunate future to it for both the Caribbean um, and the East Coast of the United States. So this is, really demonstrates what has been identified as a, a substantial forecast problem at the Hurricane Center. Not only is RI an issue to, to forecasters, it's now this moderate shear range, which a lot of storms fall into. So the goal of our research um, is to not only help the forecasters, but also understand the processes behind these storms that just maybe will help us understand why some storms intensify and some do not within the shear value. So, so responses of TCs generally are, are pretty well accepted that low shear gives you a fairly favorable environment for intensification that would be below 10 knots over a deep layer. And then high shear above 20 knots typically is less favorable, although there has been certainly some case studies that have shown that Storms can certainly intensify in 20 knot shear, uh, and there are mechanisms behind that. But these moderate shear values of 10 and 20 knots between 850 and 200, the TC response seems to be rather uncertain. I just showed two examples of that uncertainty. And so there really is a significant uh, forecast uncertainty that lies in this, this shear range, and the Hurricane Center has specifically identified these moderate shear cases as being one of their forecast issues in addition to RI. RI is simply just a subset of intensification rates um, that can occur within this shear range. And so our goal uh, as a group at HRD and many others, Rosie's done some fantastic work on this, uh, is to really understand the processes at play here. And certainly I think the question is, what are the symptoms of storms within this shear value in organization that would tell us that it will either intensify or not intensify? So we really ask a fundamental question in our approach. What are the symptoms or the precursor conditions of TCs they're about to experience intensification, and how they differ uh, from those storms that do not intensify. In particular, we want to take those symptoms, and it could be from aircraft data or satellite data, and identify the processes behind those symptoms, which is the bigger challenge. And a lot of times the observing systems aren't capable of doing that, so we would need help from, say, numerical modeling to fill those gaps. 
So this talk is strictly about the observations. That's something that Rob and Leon and, and many others have been looking at. But we do also have some folks doing some modeling work, both uh, an ensemble framework and an idealized framework for looking at processes behind the relationships that I'm about to present. And so the few sort of specific questions that we've been asking and, and what a lot of us are interested in is what is the role of precipitation? in these storms. So we're really looking at the early stages of these storms before and then during their intensification period. And I, I put deep convection in quotation or in the, in the parentheses afterwards because precipitation is actually a little bit more complicated. We often like to use the word convection, but deep convection tends to be only about 10% of the raining area in a storm. Stratiform rainfall is the dominant precipitation type, and they may play two different roles. I'm not going to talk about that necessarily today. I will show one slide that separates stratiform convection, but we are just talking about precipitation processes because they could differ in, in, in between the deep convection component and the stratiform component. And then what is the relationship between these precipitation processes and how the inner core evolves, specifically the thermodynamic properties? We will see from the thermodynamic side there are aspects to sheared storms, particularly in the early stages, that appear to have to be overcome. There tends to be drier air and subsidence and more st uh, stability in certain parts of the storm. And precipitation not only plays a role perhaps in dictating that, but also uh, the storm may respond in that way. So we want to identify a relationship not only with the precipitation and the kinematic side, which is the next question, but also the thermodynamic side. So on the kinematic side, uh, vortex tilt is also obviously very important. When you have a sheared storm, you tend to see a tilt of the vortex with height. And dynamically, that can induce subsidence up shear. You tend to favor ascent up shear. And so things have to evolve within the vortex as well. And so all of these are very much related to one another, precipitation, vortex tilt, and the thermodynamic conditions. And so we want to identify symptoms in all of these and, I, and sort of get a very specific timeline of how events are occurring for storms that then intensify versus those do not intensify. And so again, this, this talk that I'm going to do is really a compilation of efforts on the observational side. I'll show some satellite data, some aircraft data from recent case studies, as well as some satellite composites, uh, showing sort of the impact of precipitation, how it evolves, and then also some aspects of the vortex structure, and then also the moisture characteristics in and around the near environment and inner core of the storm. So to start with the precipitation, I just wanted to highlight uh, a recent study that uh, I did with um, Ed and, and Trey at Utah. And something we've been doing, really focusing on, is getting away from the case study framework and getting into the composite framework, accumulating massive amounts of observational data. And one thing we've been working on over the last few years is accumulating all of the passive microwave overpasses of tropical cyclones globally. Um, and that would include early stages and even the genesis stage. And now we've got about 17 years, um, all the way since 1998, of uh, subset of tropical cyclone pixels from a passive microwave. And these are, as it stands, they're only the imaging channels of a passive microwave. So you have sounders, which help you with the moisture, humidity conditions, but then we have imagers, which help us with precipitation. So right now we've subset of pixels for precipitation. So this would be, the, say, the 37 gigahertz channel, which detects emission from liquid water which would help you for, say, raining area, and then also the scattering channels, like I showed earlier, which is 85 to 91 gigahertz, indicating more the convec deep convective area. And so what Trey has done here for, for part of his master's thesis was composite these overpasses for various intensification rates. And I know it's kind of hard to see here, but essentially each one of these panels represents a composite of those passive microwave pixels at the high frequency, the scattering channels, for various intensification rates. So this is a weakening of greater than 20 knots in 24 hours. This one here is a weakening of 15 to 20 knots in 24 hours. This is 10 to 5 weakening knots. And then we begin intensification, 0 to 5 knots in 24 hours, 10 to 15 knots, 20 to 25 knots. And then these are your RI, if you, wanna, uh, if you define RI as 30 knots in 24 hours. So we have 30 to 35, and then greater than 35 knots intensification in the next 24 hours. And what he's done is he's rotated all these pixels with respect to the vertical wind shear vector. So in this case, the vertical wind shear direction, the heading, is pointing up. And then so we have the down shear left quadrant, the down shear right quadrant, the up shear left quadrant, and the up shear right quadrant. I'll try to, we don't always use, not everybody uses the up configuration to it. I'll be sure to note when it's not in that configuration. So the first thing that you'll, and, and so what actually I should say, what's, what's being shown here is the, the distribution, basically the occurrence of having passive microwave pixels less than 250 Kelvin brightness temperature. 
you can eventually say this is the raining area. Let's just call it that. You can certainly go to lower brightness temperatures, say below 200 Kelvin, 150 Kelvin. That would give you the area and occurrence of deep convection. We're using a higher threshold, which gives you more sort of the raining area. So the redder the pixels, the more occurrence of those, those we'll call them raining pixels, just as a proxy. And so the first thing that you'll note a lot of time is, is that predominantly precipitation in a shear relative framework is down shear and there tends to be less precipitation up shear. That's a sign of a storm that is uh, experiencing shear. And lower shear, you do tend to see a little bit more symmetry, and that's a lot of times you'll find out why they're more favorable for intensification. But now this does not separate monoshear cases. That's something we're actually about to do. But uh, a lot of the cases in here, of course, monoshear values tend to be in the frequency distribution, the peak for uh, shear values. And so what you'll notice about this relationship between intensity change rate and the occurrence of precipitation is that as you increase the intensification rate, you see more occurrence of precipitation up shear, particularly for these RI cases. So you see more of the frequency in the up shear quadrants. That's a really distinguishing feature of storms that are undergoing intensification, particularly rapid intensification. So that was a composite for the past microwave pixels. Cheng Tao at FIU did the precipitation radar pixels. So we have a bunch of these passive microwave sensors in space, but over the last now almost 20 years, we also have had a precipitation radar. And so there's been the trim precipitation radar and now GPM has a dual frequency radar as well. And so what uh, we've done here, uh, what Cheng has done here is actually subsetted the radar pixels and composited the radar pixels relative to shear. Uh, so this comes from the Tropical Cyclone Precipitation Feature Database. So essentially, Ch uh, uh, Chantal Lu at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, used to be at Utah, uh, found uh, contiguous raining areas within the swaths of the precipitation radar, called them precipitation features, and then Hyann built a database of subsetting those precip features for tropical cyclones. These aren't feature-based, this is pixel-based, but it just goes to illustrate that we actually quite have a lot of radar data on, on tropical cyclones from space. So what Chang did is essentially find all the raining pixels where you have a rain rate greater than zero millimeters per hour. And she did this, again, this is sort of a percent occurrence, so how often in the data set you see rainfall in these, these certain radii and azimuths. And so the top is all precipitation. This is, this is not differentiated by any particular precipitation. But what she did do is separate stratiform and then convective. One advantage, of course, is as a radar, we have reflectivity. And so the TRIM team has built algorithms that have identified using, say, melting layer identification to identify stratiform pixels from the radar and convective pixels. So you can actually separate these distributions for those two uh, precipitation types. And what she did, now this is only RI cases, but she put together a timeline of RI cases. And so this goes back to that question of what are the precursor conditions for our RI? So we can actually identify their changes in the distribution of convective and stratiform pixels before, during, and while RI is occurring. So in the left, the left uh, column here, this is 12 to 24 hours before RI onset. This is zero to 12 hours before RI onset, and then this is an RI onset to about plus 12. So she calls it RI initial, but it's essentially the first 12 hours of an RI event. And then there's an RI continuing period here, which is kind of an awkward, the, the time varies, but essentially it's between the RI initial and the RI ending, which she identifies as being 12 to 24 hours before RI ends. Uh, I'm not gonna focus on the two right anyway. Uh, these are becoming stronger storms. What I really wanna focus on are the first three columns. And so we see in the all precipitation, but a lot of what we what I want to focus on here is the difference between the stratiform and convective in this early stage. And what we find is that there is a, a sort of convective peak down shear left here, which is where we tend to see. Uh, and again, this is not shear storms, and this is still something that we have to work on in the satellite composites just doing shear storms. But our assumption is that there aren't a lot of just these aren't all low shear storms. A lot of these are, of course, moderate and perhaps even high shear. So the, the deep convection tends to be fairly locked in that down shear left quadrant. But what we find from the 12 to 24 hour before RI onset, rapid intensification onset period, and the 0 to 12 is that you see an increase in stratiform rain and a slight decrease in convection. Uh, so what it seems to be occurring, and she's shown this in some other figures I'm not showing here, is that essentially you see these convective bursts, which seem to, seem to be very prominent 12 to 24 hours before RI onset, they perhaps weaken a bit, and you see an increase in the stratiform rain percentage. Uh, 
But it's interesting where you see that stratiform rain increase. It's not only the down to your left quadrant, but you also see it's more of this gray contouring in the upshear quadrant, indicating that you're actually seeing more stratiform rainfall coming into that upshear quadrant. And that is happening before RI onset even occurs. So that is one of those symptoms that we're trying to identify. We see an increase in the not only upshear left, but even perhaps the upshear right precipitation occurrence, especially the stratiform rain as IRI onset, even before RI onset begins. And then, of course, as RI continues, you see more and more rainfall in all as you move through the storm. So deep convection is, is very important, of course, because you probably don't get the stratiform rain without the deep convection. However, what we do see is that, and, it, it, and we, we can argue that even the convective increases a little bit, but you mainly only see the real convective increase once RI is already happening. So this seems to be one of those symptoms. We'll call it precipitation. It seems to be stratiform rain, but we know that perhaps the picture is a little more complicated in that deep convection, as we'll show in one of the case studies, there are some fairly significant updrafts occurring up shear left before and during uh, RI. So, there are details on this figure that I'm going to bring up later um, because this is actually going to come into play when I talk about drop zones and the thermodynamic properties. All I want to do now is just introduce one of our recent case studies, which is uh, Hurricane Edward. Uh, myself and Rob Rogers uh, led a two-part paper looking at Edward. It was a very, very well-observed storm in 2014. It was a time we had the NASA Global Hawk uh, airborne as well as the NOAA, and so that. It's really one of the best sampled RI events we've had recently, especially since we had the Global Hawk, we can drop a substantial amount of sons over a very long period in the storm. Uh, and with, uh, with uh, Edward, it was essentially in the central Atlantic, um, and it had an RI event. So this right here goes from the 11th of September to the 22nd 2nd of September, and it just shows the trace of the maximum wind speed. So you can see beginning at about 0Z in the 14th, after what was generally a slow intensification period, it undergoes a fairly rapid intensification event, hitting a peak of about 110 knots uh, late on the 16th of September, and then it immediately weakened. Uh, the boxes simply indicate the on-station times that we had aircraft in the storm, uh, the left being the Global Hawk, uh, and then the right being uh, NOAA aircraft. I'll get into some of these later, but for now, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the precipitation aspect. So we looked in close at the precipitation, how it related to a lot of the observ observations we were taking from the aircraft. So this comes from the first part of the paper that we wrote on Edward. And so what, what we've, we've put up here is essentially the uh, mean IR brightness temperature, and it's set by azimuth. So this is a time series beginning on the 11th of September, the 12th, 13th, 14th. So I said 0Z on the 14th was when RI began. That's right about here. And then we proceed all the way on through that RI event. And so this is separated by azimuth. So I just highlighted that this area is about the down shear right quadrant, down shear left, up shear left, and up shear right. And what we want to highlight, of course, is that now IR cold, cold uh, IR temperatures are not necessarily deep convective. They can certainly be anvil, but certainly uh, it is a, some indication that perhaps there's deep convection there. And what you notice is that the cold cloud, where that perhaps deep convection is located, is pretty, again predominantly down shear. And what you see up shear is just this periodic events of cold cloud getting up shear up shear left and up shear right, but it's not very persistent. You just get a convective burst, comes up shear, burst, comes up shear, burst, comes up shear. In fact, when you go into that, again, that 12 hour period before RI, we see a lot of that cold cloud go away. You see warming tops. So here we have an RI event that's about 12 hours away from starting, and yet where's the deep convection, right? And that, so that kind of goes back to that composite figure that I showed before where maybe the convection goes down, maybe the rain air goes up. So again, this is IR, so it would be more of an indicator of, of, of convection more than so than any stratiform component, but it is very interesting to see that that deep convection tends to maybe not be as uh, uh, present in the hours before RI. And we've actually seen this in the genesis too. Right before a lot of these genesis events, you see actually a decrease in sort of the convective area. And then as soon as you get RI, boom, you start seeing these convective cycles again, and then guess what? Now you start to see that coverage increase up here. Uh, the lightning is, is kind of tied the same way. You see predominantly lightning down shear left, and you start to see very small events of, of lightning come up shear. This is simply a sequence of passive microwave images like I had shown from Harvey earlier. This is about when RI began, and so again, you see these sort of intense convective events, at least according to the scattering, indicating that there's, there's a lot of ice content coming up shear uh, before RI even begins. So that, again, seems to be our symptom that RI perhaps could occur. 
And so we had aircraft data, and that, that was all satellite data. And what Rob has been able to, to show is he's taken the radar data, identified uh, convective updrafts. And so he goes in the radar data, and, and what we're showing now is where he's identified uh, eight uh, strong updrafts, being the green three meter per second and black being five meter per second, updrafts that are occurring between eight and 16 kilometers. And again, this is shear oriented. This time, his shear vector, uh, this was Earth relative, so the shear vector is pointing to the sort of the west northwest, down shear right, down shear left, and up shear left. And what he has here is his two individual flights. This flight occurred during the RRI period. This flight occurred during the, the uh, steady state period, and the steady state being this is actually a major hurricane, but has already reached its peak. In fact, we would argue that this is already undergoing weakening. And so I think the most important point here is from the RI event during this sort of earlier stage, and we see some very strong updrafts originating perhaps down shear left. There's some lightning associated with it, and they rotate up shear left as well. And so we get some fairly significant updrafts. And, but the we actually kind of looked a little bit more into these, and in fact, while they are updrafts above eight kilometers, 10 kilometers, uh, most of these are associated with very strong downdrafts below eight kilometers. So they're kind of a peak updraft. You can kind of think of it as a vehicle. They kind of initiate down shear right, they go down shear left, and they come up, up shear left. But a lot of what happens up shear left is you get precipitation fallout up shear left. So it's deep convection in the sense that we see an ice scattering signature and a strong vertical velocity, but it's a little more complicated than that because you're getting a lot of precipitation fallout from those. And so there's just another couple of cases that Leon Wen did. Uh, this is uh, two cases of Bertha and Cristobal from, from 2014. Bertha, he is identified having an RI event. This storm is actually weaker than what you see from Cristobal. The thing with Cristobal is it's actually steady state at this time. Uh, so what he's pointing out with Bertha is again, so this is, this is composite reflectivity uh, from the tail Doppler radar from a P3 mission into Bertha. Oriented with shear this time, again, Earth was to the shear is pointing to the southeast. And what he's just simply demonstrating here is the coverage of reflectivity up shear left versus Cristobal steadies a storm where you don't see as much precipitation coming into the up shear quadrants. And just one more case demonstrating uh, precipitation, and there's an extra point we want to make about this. So this was uh, from a series of flight into Hurricane Hermine, or the actual pre-period of Her uh, Hurricane Hermine last year. Uh, we had a number of P3 missions from the wave stage all the way to a recurving in the Gulf of Mexico, becoming a hurricane. And we've, Rob and I kind of tried a different metric. And the metric that we have attempted to plot here is the azimuthal coverage of reflectivity. So in the upshare quadrant. So you look at every, az so you basically take the covered reflectivity at each, throughout that azimuth, at each radius away from the center in the upshare quadrant and with height. So this is not reflectivity itself, this is simply a fractional coverage. And so this is a sequence of flights into Hermine, and again, it's a very weak storm here, it's 30 knots. And over a sequence of 12 to 24 hours, even though it remains 30 knots, what we actually found from the reflectivity is that you see an increase in coverage of reflectivity in the upshare quadrant, but you also see a growth of that reflectivity. So you see more and more reflectivity at a higher and higher altitude with time. And it just so happens after we see a lot of this, then it undergoes its intensification. It actually intensified to a hurricane. This was simply just one flight when it was 45 knots. But it's this upscale, this upscale growth process in the upshare quadrants that really interests us. And it interests us because, as I'll show later, the thermodynamic conditions are very limiting convection early on, but oftentimes we think we see a change in that thermodynamic condition such that you can allow convective growth to happen upshare. So we just wanted to add another little wrinkle in here, which is the vortex tilt. So Rob, and this is really recent, uh, so uh, I hesitated with Rob to show this, but he, he already showed this at a meeting uh, overseas a couple weeks ago, so I'll show it. Um, we're essentially trying to relate the timing that the vortex tilt changes. I said the shear storms, and Hermine is a sheared, uh, moderately sheared storm. Sheared storms, of course, tend to have their mid-level and upper-level center farther away from the low-level center. So we need to reduce that tilt. We know we need to reduce that tilt in order to intensify a storm. The question is, how is it timed for when we see that increase of precipitation up shear? And so Hermine is just one example of looking at that sort of time frame. Now, it's kind of hard because we're only getting kind of daily looks from, from the aircraft data, but there's uh, some seem to be some suggestion here that as soon as you get that vortex tilt, you see the precipitation symmetry increase. So here's an early stage flight against 30 knots, and I know it's really hard to see some things in here. Essentially, he's contoured here in the colors, the reflectivity um, average between two to eight kilometers. Uh, the 
the he has the two kilometer eight kilometer streamlines the image is centered at the two kilometer center the white streamlines are eight kilometers but to make it easier sort of this is his slide i'll blame it on rob uh, is the the x here is essentially showing the eight kilometer center uh from the streamlines and so what you see here is that the two and eight kilometer center during the early stages storm is very displaced from one another uh more than 100 kilometers and it's even more displaced here but then what ends up happening we see that they become more aligned and when they do become more aligned is when you start to see really solid precipitation coverage up shear. So we're not saying that we're going to be able to answer this question about the timing of these. Models have shown that as soon as you get that vortex aligned, you see the precipitation increase. Um, but it does at least some suggest that that relationship, of course, should uh, be valid. But that's just one single storm. And so what we're interested in doing now is going back into the record of the TDR, the tail Doppler radar data from all these NOAA P3 Hurricane 100 missions, identifying those cases that were in moderate shear storms and during the early stages. And then again, identifying the relationships between the precipitation, at least the precipitation structure from the radar, and then also the vortex tilt. And so what he's recently done is he's identified 22 missions from the NOAA P3 in six uh, storms. This is just a number of 50 eyewall penetrations. It's important to us who actually fly how many penetrations you get. Uh, and the uh, storms are all in this 30 to 65 knots. So they're not quite hurricane. They're, they're borderline hurricanes, but mostly tropical storm. And they're all moderately sheared storms. And you can see the ones here, Hermine, Carl. Carl was one of our comparative cases from last year because it was a storm, as I showed earlier, that was in a shear but did not intensify. And then Kyle, Diley, uh, Ophelia. And he separated the missions as those that intensify, and he calls at 10 knots in 12 hours, versus those that are steady state storms during this flight, uh, during the flight in which you really only see, say, five to f uh, between negative and five knots uh, in the 12 hours. Then uh, these are just showing the statistics, basically, that have been summarized there. So he's looking now at the relationship between vortex tilt and, and uh, the intensity change rate in the subsequent 12 hours. And so on the bottom is that two to eight kilometer tilt. So the distance between the two kilometer center and the eight kilometer center, according to the radar, versus a 12 hour intensity change rate. And unfortunately, this image doesn't show that there's much of a relationship. So uh, these each represented an individual flight into these storms. Uh, but unfortunately, if you were to say that there's some uh, increased intensity change or there's, there's, an there's a higher intensity change rate for, for lower tilt, it doesn't seem to be there. And what he cautions, and, I, and we, we have to absolutely agree with that, is that sometimes it's very hard to locate the 8-kilometer center. You depend on having some return at that altitude. So unless you have deep precipitation, it's very hard to get a retrieval of that wind and then the vortex at that altitude. So. Um, I would say that there's probably more cases we have to analyze here and certainly have to look at the radar coverage. The other relationship that he's trying to identify is the up shear precipitation coverage, as we had shown in that metric from Hermine, versus the 12 hour intensity change rate. So this is that two to eight kilometer coverage of precipitation up shear. So as you go to one, that represents 100% coverage. And this is integrated over the entire uh, layer in the, in, the, in the radar. In the 12 hour, now you can see there is actually a bit of a relationship. As you increase the coverage up shear precipitation, you tend to see higher intensity change rates in the subsequent 12 hours. So he's still doing some work on this. He's also trying to identify the actual vortex tilt uh, directions uh, as time goes on as well. So looking forward to continuing that work. And so now I want to just add in the last component. I talked about the precipitation and then also talked about the vortex tilt. But there's one other aspect to this. This is how does the thermodynamic conditions evolve in a storm which is sheared? What you tend to see uh, is that when you get a sheared storm and you get a vortex misalignment, dynamically you tend to see subsidence in the upshear quadrants, which limits deep convection. Whereas down shear, you tend to see the ascent. That's where you see all that precipitation, like I showed from the composite. So the question then is, how do you get rid of those seemingly unfavorable thermodynamic conditions in the inner core, in your environment, up shear, in order to intensify the storm? We know we need more precipitation up shear, but how does that actually happen? So Edward is one of the cases that we've used to examine this. We're not saying we answered that question with this, but we at least have some hypotheses from Edward. And so now I return to this slide. And so returning to Edward, what we've done is identified uh, aircraft missions during certain periods of this storm. So we have, again, these are Global Hawk missions, the on-station time of Global Hawk missions in Edward. These are combined, between, these right are combined for the NOAA P3 uh, and the NOAA G4, which is the high altitude jet aircraft that tend to fly around the environment of the storm. 
And so we had a global hawk flight here early dur during the, uh, Edward during its kind of slow intensification period. Uh, it was still a tropical storm, and this is and this is the coverage of SANS from that global hawk flight. And then you can then see uh, the rapid intensification period. We had the global hawk flight as well, so no aircraft. You can see all the SANS from that mission. Uh, the gray is actually a single G4 mission. There was no other coincident aircraft at the time. The black is uh, representing the peak period in the storm when it was already a Category 3 hurricane, 110 knots, beginning to weaken. And then we have a later period here from the Global Hawk when it was weakening. I'm not going to talk about that flight. Uh, really, really high shear value already undergoing a transition type event. And so what I've done is composited the drops on profiles in a shear relative sense from each one of those missions. So I'll go through this figure right here. These are, uh, these are relative humidity, composite profiles of relative humidity. This is 1,000 millibars to 200 millibars, so increasing with height. And so you see the composite profile from the slow intensification period, the RI period, the peak period, and the weak period. And again, this is the composite for the down shear left quadrant, the down shear right, the up shear left quadrant, and the up shear right. And what I want to point out from this, this, uh, these figures is that in the downshear quadrant, from each one of these periods, which represents also in time, you see very little change in the humidity profile. Okay? Same goes for downshear right, and you would expect that. That's where predominantly precipitation is occurring. You don't expect to see large changes in the humidity uh, during those three periods, at least during the, uh, up to the peak period, the weak period, then you get a really, really, really high shear value, and then things change. But at least from SI to RI to peak, there's very little change. But where you do see changes are in the upshear quadrant. So in the upshear left quadrant, this is the profile during the slow intensification period, and the green is during the RI period. And what we've seen is that you see an increase in the relative humidity uh, in the middle to upper troposphere from the slow intensification to the RI and then to the peak. That increase we see is delayed upshear right, such that the SI pro uh, profiles and the RI profiles are about the same, and you only really see an increase in the humidity in the upshear right quadrant until you get to that peak period. There's a little bit of a data gap in there where we don't have a sounding, but it does seem that the upshear right would be the most delayed, and that kind of makes sense. Considering what I showed the precipitation, you tend to see an increase in the upshear left quadrant, and then you see the upshear right quadrant increase when you begin to see a fully symmetric storm in terms of precipitation. So this seems to align. Now, there aren't a lot of profiles on here, and one of the purposes of me being here... Oh, sorry, Chris, yes. Sure. Exactly what you're about to say. How many there aren't as many profiles as we'd like to be in there, right? Um, so... That's true. And so the, the issue that we have, and, and one of the reasons why we're here, is that there's actually a fairly significant data gap in the drops on record in tropical cyclones. For, for uh, Traditionally, the, the, the highest altitude aircraft we have consistently is the NOAA G4. The G4 tends to fly in the environment. They don't want to fly in turbulence. They stay away from the inner core of the storm. So we don't get a lot of deep profiles there. The P3 doesn't fly above the melting layer, typically, unless it's well outside of the rain and ice and, and lightning environment. So the P3 is not very helpful in that regard either. The Global Hawk, for now, is one of the only real platforms that we have that have deep profiles within the, the near inner core of the storm. So uh, we, what we do, what we can say is that looking at the individual profiles, there is quite a bit of what I call, these are substance signatures, so you can see the substance inversions, all the way from uh, the higher altitudes I've shown a second, even the lower altitudes, which seems to be related to precipitation. You see a lot less of those profiles during that peak stage uh, of the storm. So at least it does seem that, I mean, you would expect, though, from theory, that there should be drier air up shear. It's just that, yes, the precise increase is something that we can't really say because we just simply don't have the measurements in order to, to state it. But it does seem to remove the subsidence uh, over time. Um, and I, this is just an example of, we did look at some individual soundings, and these are some of the examples of soundings we see in the upshear quadrant. These are, again, from the high, the, the Global Hawk. Global Hawk is flying at 60,000 feet, so we're getting uh, all the way up to 30, 40 millibars. So it's, it's pretty exciting data. And, we hope that the Global Hawk will have a place in TCs in the future because of that reason. Uh, I don't want you to focus necessarily on the sequence of drops on here, uh, just to say that this is during a period on the 12th of September when it was a weak tropical storm. Uh, these are both profiles from that period. There was a weak tropical storm kind of experiencing uh, a slow intensification period. But what I want to highlight from some of these, and these are, these are up shear profiles, is that we see a number of these substance, and these substance inversions, these are very ubiquitous for, for a lot of the soundings we saw in the upshear quadrant in the upper troposphere. Uh, we can only hypothesize that these are perhaps dynamically forced. Certainly, if they're right near convection, they could be forced uh, substance from convection. But they are something that we see a lot of uh, in these, these soundings. 
soundings from Edward. The other profiles that we tend to see are ones with these kind of onion soundings. Onion soundings, because it kind of looks like an onion. It was termed by Ed Zipser, my old advisor. Um, essentially, what these are, these are formed by when you see very light precipitation. And when the precipitation, kind of when it gets to the melting layer, begins to evaporate. And when, you're with, when you have no precip left, you just are left with adiabatic compression. So you see this warming and drying in that layer. So this would be indicative of perhaps sort of a light precipitation occurring in the Epsher quadrant that's just simply evaporating and leaving adiabatic compression. But what that does do is it leaves us a very stable profile in the low troposphere. And so that's what's really what we're trying, the message we're trying to give here is that even with a lot of the P3 sounds we see, it's, it is st more stable in the Upshur quadrants initially during these, these early stages of the storms. And somehow you have to overcome that, whether it's removing the dry air or simply just trying to get convection to the point where you can overcome that instability. But that's not the only picture that we, uh, message that we want to deliver here. Uh, so myself and others were focused on, on what we can from the mid troposphere component of these these drop sons. But it's already been known, it's, it's pretty well known that there's some really important aspects in the boundary layer that are occurring when these storms are trying to intensify. And so this image right here is showing the Theta E, uh, the Theta E profiles from Sons and Cristobal and Bertha. So this goes back to Leon Nguyen's paper. And again, Crystal being a 70 knot steady state storm and Bertha being an increasing, an RI storm uh, that increased to 70 knots. And so what he's highlighting here, and I know, I know they're, they're a little bit hard to see, but essentially these are the, the SON profiles and these storms from the NOAA aircraft below two kilometers. And he's again, he's got all the individual profiles. I only highlight here the, the thick uh, lines, which are the composite profiles from each shear relative quadrant. So the red profile here is the down shear right quadrant theta E profile. The blue is the down shear left profile. The green is the up shear left. And then sort of a, a yellowish orange here is the up shear right. And he's just showing simply two periods of flights in these storms, crystal ball, flight one here, flight two, flight one, Bertha, flight two. And there's some things we want to highlight. And he's certainly not the first one to show this. Many have already shown it, is that you tend to see your highest theta E and your greatest instability. And we, 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 der we derive that based on the lapse rate of theta E with height. So the more that the theta E falls off at the height, the more convectively unstable the profile. So the down shear right quadrant tends to be the highest theta E and the most unstable. That's where we tend to see that convective development happening. We see that both in the radar and indicative in the, the satellite composites. And then precipitation kind of maximizes convection precipitation maximizes in the down shear left quadrant. And what we see from the low theta E profile is a much more stable sounding and a much lower theta E in the boundary layer. So what you're getting is essentially a lot of convective downdrafts, which are pooling the boundary layer with this, this low theta E air. Not very helpful to a storm that's trying to intensify, something that you actually have to overcome in order to help the storm intensify. That kind of sounding persists into the upshear left quadrant, but then when you get around to the upshear right quadrant, you actually then start to see a little bit of a recovery of that theta E once it gets away from that uh, downdraft region left of shear. So the downshear right is the highest theta E, most unstable. Downshear left, upshear left, we'll just say the left of shear quadrants tend to see the lowest theta E at a more stable low level profile. You don't see as much convective development there. But what, but what Leon was trying to highlight from these, these two cases was that if you look, even though the surface values of theta E might be similar, the look of the profile, especially in terms of the instability, are quite different from the two of these storms. The Cristobal case and the left of shear quadrants tends to be quite stable. You see uh, in, in the low theta E. But when you look at the profiles from Bertha, you still see this fall off with height with the theta E, indicating that there's still convective instability left to shear and up shear in Bertha. So what he's hypothesizing here, and I think it's a decent hypothesis, is that storms that intensify through the enthalpy, enthalpy fluxes can simply overcome this, this, this cool uh, dry air in the boundary layer. It's, it's fairly ubiquitous. We see it in, in all the storms, certainly not the first ones, Cristobal and Bertha. But it's how the storm responds and how it recovers this, this low theta air. Because if it can recover, then you get that instability and you create the possibility of creating deep convection. So one other thing that, that uh, Leon was highlighting was also this, kind of the source of this low theta air. And one thing that he found, and again, these are, are kind of lucky profiles. We said that the Global Hawk is one of the only, but once in a while you'll see the G4 get a little bit closer to the storm core here. 
And what he's showing here are the skew T, uh, the, the solid again being the, the, the mean profiles in the skew T. And now I'm only highlighting the up sheer left and the down sheer right quadrants from Cristobal and Bertha. And what you'll should be fairly jump out to you is, is the differences here above 400 millibars in the upper troposphere. You have this massive dry intrusion. This was a dry intrusion coming from the mid-latitudes in a storm relative sense, getting into the core of the storm, likely contributing to those really strong drown drafts in, in Cristobal that were unable to be recovered in order to allow the boundary to be more favorable to intensifying the storm. You don't see those as much uh, within Bertha. So this dry intrusion can do a couple of things. It can either uh, weaken the updraft strength or can, of course, increase the downdraft strength. Either way, we see that low with ADE air happen in Cristobal, get around up here, but not yet. It just doesn't able to recover to create that instability to generate the deep convection up here. So what Leon did, and we have to give him a lot of credit, he worked a lot of time on, on, on skim, these conceptual models, and I had a professor once said, all conceptual models are crap, but some are useful. Um, this one might be pretty useful. Um, he essentially has created a schematic that compares uh, non-intensifier with an intensifier. I just want to start with the intensifying one. And so just to, to orient yourself here, he's got a shear vector which is kind of coming out of, out, of, out of the wall there, out of the page. And the column is simply showing the vortex tilt with height, the circulation tilt with height. So in the down shear right quadrant, and then here's down shear left, up shear left farther away, and then up shear right coming around back to us. In the down shear right quadrant, you tend to see convective development, although he didn't quite indicate with that figure, but you also see this, he's indicating a, a nice reservoir of high theta E error, and again, an instability which can contribute to convective development down shear right, as we often see. And then you get a peak in the convection and the precipitation down shear left, but then he, as he indicates in those cooler coolers, you begin to see that boundary layer, that cool dryer in the boundary layer uh, stabilize the low, the low troposphere, and that persists all the way through the up shear quadrants. And what he's also indicating here, of course, is that mid intrusion, that upper, mid upper intrusion of, of dry air, which again is inhibiting potential for deep convection in that area, as well as the subsidence that we suspect is pretty ubiquitous up shear during these, these tilted storms. And so simply this diagram, I think he was trying to say here is that you just don't recover that low theta air in time. You're not getting the enthalpy fluxes to recover that low theta air to allow the storm to possibly have a chance of becoming more symmetric. On the other hand, the intensifying TCs look a little bit different to us. So you can see that, that reservoir of high theta air again that's contributing to the convective development. You see that peak in the convection down shear left, but now what he's indicating is that precipitation now gets up shear left. Now I go back to that fallout idea, and so we tend to see a little bit of that drier air up shear, and the question is how do you remove that dry air? Is it simply a result of decreasing, the, aligning the vortex such that you're not really getting that, that compensating, that, uh, that driven substance anymore, or is there something uh, a bigger factor involved? And so something that we're hypothesizing about removal of that dry air is that yes, you do need to decrease the vortex tilt. You need to align the vortex. Whether the shear reduces and that allows it to align or there's some other process through precession or convection that allows that vortex to align is, so there's some good work going on with that. We don't try to answer that here, but if you do have dry air, you have to remove it somehow, and, and we have two hypotheses for that, either or both, that when this precipitation comes from the down shear left quadrant and comes up shear and falls out, you could humidify kind of from the top down. As it continues, you get each one of these bursts comes up shear, you just get more precipitation, and just kind of allows you to humidify the top down. Think of being out here when you get really dry in troposphere and you get verga. If it rains enough, you get enough verga over a prolonged enough time, eventually you'll get surface precipitation. Uh, the other side of this aspect is that if you are getting the fluxes to recover this low with ADE air, you could gradually build convection upward. So you start out with fairly shallow cumulus, and then that gradually builds up over time getting higher R and detraining in the metroposphere. You detrain the metroposphere, you moisten the metroposphere, you can help promote more deep convection. So either, it could be one of these processes that are occurring. But either way, you do need to recover that, that downdraft air, which is stabilizing the boundary layer. That seems to be one of the key components here, in addition to the vortex tilt, in order to uh, create a more symmetric uh, storm. So a lot of that what you see there is, is a lot of this case study work and, and uh, starting some composites, but we really do want to go beyond the case studies. And so what we're beginning to do is start compositing more of this airborne data. So Rob uh, is, is interested in, in more compositing the tail Doppler radar data from the NOAA P3. Uh, 
it's been mined in sort of an axisymmetric sense and a little bit in the shear relative sense, but we think there's more we can do, specifically looking again at these moderate shear storms and looking at that precipitation structure. Is it convective? Is it stratiform? Is it this very interesting profile we see up here left where you get a really strong updraft above eight kilometers but really strong downdraft below? What is the influence of that downdraft we already see possibly in the boundary layer? And then also the drop sun data, and that's one of the main reasons I'm here is also to talk about uh, the drops on compositing. So, of course, NCAR here has produced a long-term hurricane drops on archive. Our goal is to make it more complete and advance it uh, by adding some value-added metrics that allow us to composite that drops on for things like intensity change rates, current intensity, SST, and so forth. We do have some ongoing work uh, in, in numerical simulations, so both idealized and ensemble simulations focused on examining these relationships. We, at the very least, we could identify these relationships through observations, but we simply just don't fly frequent enough to really get at the processes. So if the models can replicate the symptoms that we see of storms that are intensifying, we believe that the models could hint then and at the processes that are occurring. And then from the data collection side, uh, with the Hurricane Center now placing a real focus on these monitor shear storms, uh, we've evolved the hurricane field program that we have at HRD to include an experiment specifically targeting the early stages of storms. There was a rapid intensification experiment under the intensity forecast program that we operate annually at Hurricane Research Division, but it, it was loose on its hypotheses and we tended to just go after hurricanes. But now we want to go after those early stages and get those observations during the early stages of storms. In particular, we have an observing strategy to get the P3 to a high altitude make the pilots very uncomfortable and get high altitude drop zones in the near inner core. We didn't accomplish it that this season, but uh, for a couple of circumstances, but we hope to do it next year. So from this year, we did sample a dedicated apex experiment. This is the experiment uh, focusing on early stages and shared storms. Uh, in uh, Hurricane Nate, uh, it was a storm, kind of a later season here, it was in October, came out of that gyre region in the Caribbean, eventually became a hurricane. The issue with Nate is that it was one of the fastest moving storms we had ever seen in the Gulf of Mexico. So that makes it kind of hard to analyze these kinds of processes. Uh, we did a number of flights into Hurricane Harvey in the Gulf of Mexico. The storm was undergoing rapid intensification. Wasn't a moderate shear case, but still gets us at the intensification events. The difference between Nate's and Harvey is that Harvey, were, Harvey was operationally tasked missions, so we dropped a lot less sons than we did in Nate. Uh, Irma is an interesting storm for us because it was a category, it was actually a category three hurricane when we began to sample it. It had already gone one RI event, and then while we were out there east of the Caribbean, it underwent a second RI event as a category three hurricane, which is relatively rare. Uh, it went from 100 knots to 100, uh, 150, no, 160 knots. So uh, it's a kind of a different RI event that we can look at. And then Tropical Storm Franken is kind of one of our null cases because it was a tropical storm in the Gulf, didn't really intensify, didn't really organize. Unfortunately, with Franklin, we just didn't get that many flights in it. But uh, we did, so we've, we begin to put forth this effort and essentially with this part of this experiment, we're, we're focusing on sort of a sustained measurement strategy going forward to look at these kinds of storms. Uh, so I've just got some references, some of the papers that we've all shown here and uh, be happy to take a few questions. Thanks. Okay, questions? Evan. So it seems like more and more we're finding that, you know, shear on its own, you know, it's not great, but not that bad. Dry air on its own, not that bad, but you put them together, the combination of those two. Yes can really hamper intensification. Would, would you say this supports that? I would say, yeah, that's, that's, that's quite supportive. And, it, and, and that's really where our challenge kind of lies because there's, there's multiple components to this. It's the vortex tilt. It's, it's not just dry air that could be induced from the storm itself. There's entrainment of dry air. So we have to identify sources of dry air as well and how you remove them. And it's, it's what we haven't quite gotten yet is that timing, that sequence and timing and being just a multi-scale process, it's hard to get that time, and the observations don't really help us. So we look to, for you kind of guys to really help us a little bit with, with that timing, but you're right, it's, it's a real complex interplay. Uh, but in the sense that you do see these things coincident, when you see higher shear, you tend to see the drier air that you have to overcome. It's, it's rare that you see a, a moderately sheared storm that doesn't have to overcome some sort of dry air in one of its, one of its regions. Even Harvey, which was an eight, eight non sheared storm, had to overcome that asymmetry. Uh, in your analysis of the thermodynamics of uh, Edward and some other cases, uh, your diagnostics primarily focused on the moisture field. Um, 
you know, for good reasons. But I was thinking about some studies that show um, you almost have to get a, a cold anomaly in low levels to yes. before you get intensification. Do you see that as well in, in your analyses? Uh, and follow-on question would be, uh, what's, what's your thinking on why that might matter? It's interesting. The, the why it matters is a, a tougher question. Does it happen? I, I would say yes. And actually, we've we've done some composite drop sun studies of storms transitioning from genesis, and genesis into tropical depression, and we tend to see that that cool anomaly at low troposphere. Does it? But is it really impacting the storm all that much? I mean, you've got tremendous amounts of latent heating aloft, so you're still lowering the surface pressure, and it doesn't it doesn't seem to be in some respect. Is it a challenge to the storm? I, it's hard to say. I, I don't know if it is a challenge to the storm. Uh, in a sense that it could maybe recover that over time as you increase wind speed and get increased enthalpy fluxes, then it likely can then overcome that. But until you get a strong hurricane, you do tend to see that low cool anomaly. Yeah. Um, one thing I would say it seems to be common, uh, we're talking about shear and then dry air, is symmetry in general. And, you know, be it with precipitation but um, or... I, I'm coming at things from a very close to the surface level. I have, you know, when I first started not looking at uh, case studies, I was getting hell, and now it seems to be in vogue here to be looking at composites, so it's great. Things have come around. Um, I agree with that approach because you can always get an exception and kind of look at that. But when we're, I've been looking at what promotes symmetry within the air sea interaction field. Right. And one thing I would look at is, you know, people get hung up on shear magnitude too, but it seems like uh, the work that um, Evan and I have done, I'm looking at literally 40, 50, 50 years of storms from buoy analyses yep. of air-sea interaction, is that the direction matters. Yes. And the storm direction, if you get, it'd be interesting to look at, you know, you're, you're concentrating up this, these cold pools or these dry areas aloft. What we've seen is that um, if you have some sort of northerly component to the shear or even just the direction right. of flow, the environmental flow, that is something that is um, that promotes symmetry. Right. And when you get these on the down shear, especially on the well, the up shear left and rapid and coming into the to the um, up shear right, where you have that low theta E air. If you look at some of your profiles, you also have gigantic enthalpy fluxes. Yes. So you're getting you're get, you're getting that recovery, and you get more of that recovery right. when you have that flow pattern. Right. So it's. Um, Maybe it gets a little bit to what George was saying about looking at these cold pools, but looking at really low. So what you see at near surface is quite different than maybe than what you're looking at in the profile. So, I mean, well. we're under the assumption that a lot of what happens in the mid-troposphere then gets reflected in, in the near surface. Um, I think you, you bring up a good point, and it reminds me about shear calculation itself is actually more complicated than we like to make it out to be. It's uh, depending on the calculations, you could get widely varying uh, uh, magnitudes of shear. But it's also that orientation of the motion and the shear. And there could be I mean, more favorable configurations, uh, despite what would apparently be unfavorable. What's critical, too, is last comment on this, is that it's you put everything in a shear framework, but also, again, back from looking at the surface fluxes and looking at the, the, the interface, it really you really can't ignore what the Earth relative is. For example, no. you get cooling on the right from the ocean to, because the winds are stronger yep. and you get uh, you, you just get the, the, yep. the, the structure many people have shown on right. the right. Um, so if you have, let's say, down shear, if you have shear that's coming from the north, then your down shear left is on that right, right side, which helps actually counter that. Yep. So it, it, there are orientations relative uh, when, you, when you have shear and earth combined that will give you that will combine to give you um, yeah. better or worse symmetry. And I think we have, yeah, and, and you make a great point, because we have to keep that in mind as we go forward with these composites, because it's, it's not as simple as we like it to be. So that, that relative orientation is something we're going to keep, keep in mind. Nice talk, John. So um, you mentioned vortex tilt a couple of times, and you showed that in that scatter plot, there wasn't really the loose, much of the loose scatter plot. We'll blame Rob on that one. Yeah, there wasn't much of a relationship, and that's kind of similar to what Rob showed in his other composite yeah. analysis. So I'm wondering whether we're giving too much uh, emphasis to tilt, whether tilt is really a symptom for something else that's happening, maybe right. in the precipitation. We we tend to think about tilt driving the precipitation, but that's based on Sarah Jones' works on right. dry adiabatic vortices. So yeah. do you have any thoughts on that? 
none, none particularly. I mean, it, it just seems. I mean, pretty much every storm that completes its RI is aligned, right? And a lot of them begin not aligned. So, uh, I, I don't really have much to, to, to say on that. I, I'm sure there's many others that will, but the the timing of it, I think, is still pretty precarious. Is it is it the tilt decrease or is it the upshear precipitation increase first? And I would argue that there's storms where you see that upshear precipitation increase first and then the, the tilt kind of follows so whether they're how they're tied together is is something more complicated than i mean i can answer here but it's more complicated than we and so and unfortunately the observation is just so hard to get that because we just don't hit the storm frequently enough oftentimes it's your daily and all of a sudden uh, a 50 kilometer misalignment is already 10 kilometers the next day and um so we'll, we'll continue to try to observe it but I hope that you numerical modelers can help us answer that question. Okay. Let's uh, thank Thanks, yeah. John one more time. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>